Hi, thank you for joining me today. We're reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and we're in chapter 19, The Attainment of Peace. And today we are on section six, The Attraction of Guilt. The attraction of guilt produces fear of love, for love would never look upon guilt at all. It is the nature of love to look upon only the truth, for there it sees itself, with which it would unite in holy union and completion. As love must look past fear, so must fear see love not. For love contains the end of guilt, as surely as fear depends upon it. Overlooking guilt completely, it sees no fear. Being wholly without attack, it could not be afraid. Fear is attracted to what love sees not, and each believes that what the other looks upon does not exist. Fear looks upon guilt with just the same devotion that love looks upon itself. And each has messengers which they send forth and which return to them with messages written in the language in which their going forth was asked. Love's messengers are gently sent and return with messages of love and gentleness. The messengers of fear are harshly ordered to seek out guilt and cherish every scrap of evil and of sin that they can find, losing none of them on pain of death and laying them respectfully before their Lord and Master. Perception cannot obey two masters, each asking for messages of different things in different languages. What we fear would feed upon, love overlooks. What fear demands, love cannot even see. The fierce attraction that guilt holds for fear is wholly absent from love's gentle perception. What love would seek, or rather what love would look upon, is meaningless to fear and quite invisible. Relationships in this world are the result of how the world is seen, and this depends on which emotion was called on to send its messengers to look upon it and return with word of what they saw. Fear's messengers are trained through terror, and they tremble when their master calls on them to serve them, for fear is meaningless even to its friends. Its messengers steal guiltily away in hungry, away in hungry search for, of guilt, for they are kept cold and starved and made very vicious by their master, who allows them to feast openly on what they return to him. No little shed, shred of guilt escapes their hungry eyes, and in their savage search for sin they, produce, they pounce on any living thing they see and carry it screaming to their master to be devoured. Send not these savage messengers into the world to feast upon it and to prey upon reality, for they will bring you word of bones and skin and flesh. They have been sought to they have been taught to seek for the corruptible and to return with gorges filled with things decayed and rotted. To them, such things are beautiful because they seem to ally their savage pangs of hunger, for they are frantic with pain of fear and would avert the punishment of him who sends them forth by offering what they hold dear. The Holy Spirit has given you love's messengers to send instead of those you trained through fear. They are as eager to return to you what they hold dear as are the others. If you send them forth, they will seek only the blameless and the beautiful, the gentle and the kind. They will be as careful to let no act little act of charity, no tiny expression of forgiveness, no little breath of love escape their notice. And they will return with all the happy things they found to share them lovingly with you. Be not afraid of them. They offer you salvation. Theirs are the messages of safety, for they see the world as kind. If you send forth only the messengers of the Holy Spirit gives you, wanting no messages but theirs, you will see fear no more. 
the world will be transformed before your sight, cleansed of all guilt and softly brushed with beauty. The world contains no fear that you laid, that you laid not upon it. And none you cannot ask love's messengers to remove from it and see it still. The Holy Spirit has given you his messengers to send to your brother and return to you with what love sees. They have been given to replace the hungry dogs of fear you sent instead. And they go forth to signify the end of fear. Love, too, would set a feast before you on a table covered with a spotless cloth set in a quiet garden where no sound but singing and a lofty, joyous whimpering, whispering is ever heard. This is a feast that honors your holy relationship and at which everyone is welcomed as an honored guest. And in a holy instant, grace is said by everyone together as they join in gentleness before the table of communion. And I will join you there as long ago I promised and promise still, for in your new relationship am I made welcome, and where I am made welcome, there I am. I am made welcome in the state of grace, which means you have at last forgiven me. For I became the symbol of your sin, and so I had to die instead of you. To the ego, sin means death, and so atonement is achieved through murder. Salvation is looked upon as a way by which the Son of God was killed instead of you. Yet no one can die for anyone, and death does not atone for sin. But you can live to show it is not real. The body does appear to be the symbol of sin while you believe that it can get you what you want. While you believe that it can give you pleasure, you will also believe that it can bring you pain. To think you could be satisfied and happy with so little is to hurt yourself and to limit the happiness that you would have calls up, called upon pain to fill your meager store and make your life complete. This is completion as the ego sees it, for guilt, guilt creeps in where happiness has been removed and substitutes for it. Communion it is, is another kind of competition. No, completion, rather. Communion is another kind of completion which goes beyond guilt because it goes beyond the body. Well, in all honesty, I did not like this reading at all. I think this is very difficult uh, language. I don't think it makes it very clear. I think you'll need to listen to this several times. Um, and I feel like I could read it five times more and it still wouldn't really um, be easy. I'm going to put this in my words. So, first of all, you are not your body, right? You are the divine inspiration and spirit that animates the body that you reside within. You are a function of love. You are divinity. In, in that case, there should never be anything to feel guilty about. Guilt is an attraction to us because we, we believe we are separate from our divinity. And so this idea what fear would feed upon love overlooks what fear demands, love cannot see. When you are in a state of guilt or feeling guilty or thinking about guilt, you are in a state of separation. Because if you are in your loving, divine mind, guilt is not something you could even conceive of. So this is really the point of this lesson. 
I believe. The relationships in this world are the result of how the world is seen, right? How you look out at the world is how everything about the world will look to you. This, uh, the, the paragraph about savage messengers, um, I'm going to read these two paragraphs again. Relationships in this world are the result of how the world is seen, and this depends on which emotion is called on to send its messengers to look upon it and to return with word of what they saw. Fear's messengers are trained through terror and they tremble when their master calls on them to serve them, for fear is merciless even to its friends. Its messengers steal guiltily away in hungry search of guilt, for they are kept cold and starving and made very vicious by their master, who allows them to feast only upon what they return to him. No little shred of guilt escapes their hungry eyes, and in their savage search for sin, they pounce on any living thing they see and carry it screaming to their master to be devoured. I really don't care for this paragraph at all, but the, the imagery is what we're trying to understand here. It is, it, they're not savage messengers send not these savage messengers into the world to feast upon it and to prey upon reality but they're not messengers they're you they're you looking out at the world through fear and 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 because of because of the way that we have been taught to fear then they will bring you word of bones and skin and flesh. They have been sought, taught to seek for the corruptible and to return with gorges filled with things decayed and rotted. This is, this is us, each of us, through the decisions we hold in our minds, through the judgments that we have, through the fear we have, through the lack of love that we have. This is how that happens. And so the purpose here is to become an agent of love, to become an expression of love, to understand that you are not the human form in which you reside. We were talking about this earlier in a, in a different uh, uh, class today or course, um, you're, you have a human. You are not the human. You are the spirit that animates the human. You, ha you have a body. You have a human, is another way to put it. And we don't, we do not go through life understanding or acting as if we understand these things, right? So really, really dig into this uh, lesson today and realize that you are divinity in form. You are divinity in form. And your body is the housing for you to reside in while you're here. Your human being is there for you to care for and love, but it's also there for you to understand. It comes with certain wired tendencies. And this is part of the wired tendency for it to be fearful, for it to, to think that things are wrong, to feel bad about things that it's done, guilt. When in fact you are divinity. And when you understand, for example, the teachings of Neil Donald Walsh, where God has told him, no one ever does anything inappropriate given their model of the world. Given where somebody's head is at that moment, 
whatever that person is doing is exactly what they believe to be the right thing to do. And so we need to rid ourselves of the concept of guilt and let go. Let it go. You don't even want to let it be. You want to let it go because it is not something worthy of your attention. So I hope these additional words may have helped. Uh, if you'd like additional support or um, discussion, you can message me at 907-351-3003 or through SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook, lindalamp.com, lindalamp.shop. And I will see you for either the next main lesson reading next Sunday or for a daily lesson tomorrow. Namaste and much love.